Agenda, so I just thought that was like a sign in sheet. <laughs> no, you're fine. It's, yeah. it's good to sign in. Yeah. You're on the agenda. Yeah, no, okay. So I don't need to say anything now. Okay, good. All right. Uh, that takes care of public comment. Next item on the agenda is reports of committee. That's when the village uh, board members report on the committee work that they attended over the last month. The first report is the committee of the poll. Hours we had our whole meeting starting at 5 a.m. this evening, and we talked about the uh, following issues. First, we had a discussion about possible updates to our ordinance regulating backyard chickens on private property. Second, we got a report from our development services director on building code updates. Third, uh, we had a 
next report is the Finance Committee. Uh, normally, uh, are represented by that, but as we've discussed, it's home, so I'm going to ask our manager and finance director, Nikki Rubin, to report on the Finance Committee. Cool. Okay. 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 Okay.
attended a session at the Swansea office regarding an app called the Recycling Coach. The Illinois EPA has contracted with Recycling Coach to provide uh, a mobile app and website plugin for residents that will answer recycling and garbage disposal questions. Um, the implemented state, uh, sorry, the information in the app will be customized for every community. This app was recently implemented statewide in New Jersey, and early indications are that it helps improve recycling and waste disposal practices. Village staff has submitted information to the vendor and is waiting to hear what the next steps are necessary for implementation. The vendor expects that the app will go live by the end of the year, and at our last meeting, uh, we began to promote this. Um, we began to promote this app to our residents. Thank you. Um, next report is the Council for Inclusion in the Community, and our representative on that is President Scott. Thank you. Uh, the GCIC met on Monday, October 7th, and began with updates from the Community Relations, Communications, Events, and Integrated Communities and Back Subcommittees. The Community Relations Report sparked a thoughtful discussion about strengthening relationships with other agencies around Glenville and ways the Council can deepen engagement for future events. During the event subcommittee update, the event shifted to the attention shifted to the village's Light the Light celebration. The conversation reflected on successes from the previous year and explored additional opportunities for the 24 event. For now, subcommittee membership assignments would remain unchanged other than Chair Raphael Guzman uh, has moved to serve as a floater across committees. The next council meeting is scheduled for Monday, November 4th at 5.30. That report, the next report is the Preservation Commission and Trustee Ondergaard is our representative on that. The Preservation Commission met on September 24th. The commission, the, uh, commission uh, reviewed a demolition permit for 595 Longwood Avenue, a property that, while unique, is not historically significant. After discussing its, discussing its distinctive features, the commission opted not to request a meeting with the homeowners. The commission also initiated a broader discussion on raising its public profile. The ideas include organizing a lecture series, historic tours, community partnerships, and other public events. The commissioners are also working on a formal strategy uh, to promote historical preservation um, over the next year. Uh, additionally, the um, commission continued their evaluation of mid-century modern homes uh, in the village. Chairman Van Vetchen presented a list of some of these properties, which may hold historical significance due to their architecture design or contribution to neighborhood character. And this will be discussed at their coming meetings. So the next meeting of the commission is October 22nd at 5.30 p.m. Sustainability? Um, the next report is the- Oh, Tree Commission. Tree Commission. Tree Commission. Shall I? Yes. Okay. Okay, the Tree Commission met on the 23rd of September. Um, we uh, had an update on the windstorm, and kudos go to staff for the cleanup after that big storm. Um, it really collaborated the village in certain areas, and uh, we did a great job of cleaning up after that storm. Um, the uh, village staff gave an update on the fall <laughs> tree planting the ongoing new development with Forest Edge and uh, five uh, Briar Street uh, subdivisions. Um, they also finalized a proposed list of revisions to the acceptable tree planting list, and that is on the agenda later tonight. Um, the uh, commission celebrated the development of a buckthorn curbside selection collection program to help incentivize residents to remove the invasive species from the property. The program was advertised on the village website and collection began on October 7th. 
the commission is moving forward with our next project and accepting nominations for the 2025 tree of the year. And the next tree commission uh, is scheduled to meet on December 9th. Thanks for that report. That concludes the next item on the agenda is reports of officers report, so Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you. And uh, a few items that I want to report out on this evening um, a variety of subjects. So uh, my, my report's a little longer than it typically would be. So apologies in advance, but uh, a lot of information to share. Um, <clears throat> the first relates to a, a survey that was shared with a number of our residents who live in Southeast Glencoe. Um, so I want to take a step back and just refresh everybody's recollection on, on what happened and what we were seeking and kind of where staff's recommendation is on a going forward basis at this point. Back in 2022, following the receipt of several complaints from residents in Southeast Glenco, staff presented information to the village board at the June 2022 Committee of the Whole meeting about a historical anomaly that exists in this area. Approximately 131 homes have Winnetka addresses, but are wholly within the village of Glencoe's corporate limits. These homes pay property taxes to the village of Glencoe and receive all services that the village provides, including such things as snow removal, public safety services, infrastructure maintenance and investment, water distribution, among others. But these homes have a village of Winnetka address. The limits of other taxing districts that serve these homes are somewhat different. Less than half of those households are in Glencoe District 35 and the others in Winnetka District 36. All are within the Winnetka Park District and all are within the Glencoe Public Library District. As we explained at that June 2022 Committee of the Whole, some residents had reported confusion with mail delivery and other delivery services and even some problems with GPS directions to their homes uh, and general confusion. Following that staff presentation at the meeting, board asked staff to reach out to those 131 residents and gather additional feedback before any action was taken to potentially consider an update to those mailing addresses to uh, reflect the fact that they reside within the village of Blanco. Unfortunately, this project fell to the back burner and only recently, staff was able to send survey materials to those 131 homes asking about their experiences with the address anomaly and gauging interest in a possible change. <clears throat> it should be noted that the United States Postal Service advised that if the addresses were to be updated, it had to be a full scale change and could not be handled on a per household basis. We shared a great deal of information in the letter and survey that was mailed to residents and in turn took a lot of phone calls seeking to better understand what the village was asking. There was some significant confusion about those uh, questions and I want to be clear that all the village sought to outline was that the anomaly existed uh, that, and if there was interest in making a change which would not affect any of their other special districts within which they live uh, in their corporate limits, we would recommend to the village board that we further explore the change, that it was only the first step in many. Uh, I wanted to report that uh, of the survey, uh, the, the survey that was distributed, we have had a substantial response rate. 75% of the 131 residents have already submitted responses to the online survey. And at this time, over 85% of those who responded have indicated that they would like to have their mailing addresses remain as Winnetka addresses. Based on the overwhelming response to the survey, staff is recommending that we not act to make any changes. Um, and we would reach out to those residents in the area to share this information uh, still this fall. It goes without saying, but I, I wanna note emphatically that despite the confusion that this has caused, the village will, as it always has, uh, probably serve all 131 of those households. Um, we're pleased to do so, um, pleased to uh, take those calls and talk to people about what it was that we were trying to articulate and certainly uh, had no intention of causing 
uh, the confusion that uh, that came from that. Um, I have had conversations with my counterparts in the village of Winnetka. Um, just to uh, outline that, they were aware of this. They do uh, they do know about uh, the fact that this anomaly exists. Um, and I think we have been able to uh, resolve any confusion that might have been uh, between the two villages as well. But I wanted to report out on that. Our recommendation is that, as I said, given uh, what we've heard from those who have responded to the survey, and that really was the point of doing the survey in the first place, um, that folks are comfortable with the status quo. We are comfortable with the status quo. There isn't a, a preference one way or another. This was uh, to some large degree in response to complaints that we received and concerns that we had heard from some of our residents in that area. So again, I wanted to just articulate that. Uh, that's our recommendation. Unless the board disagrees, uh, we will uh, generate some communication back to those residents. Uh, the next few weeks. Yeah. Anybody want to? Yeah. I'd say get back to them as quickly as possible to put their minds at ease. Well, I, I think we've been able to put a lot of people's minds at ease in terms of the conversations that we've already had one on one. Um, and you know, some of those some of those concerns were really just um, there was a there was a lack of understanding about the fact that despite their address, they actually are residents of the village of Plunko. Um, and talking through that, it's interesting sometimes that you know you don't you may not pay attention to those taxing districts that are on your tax bill. You sometimes may not you you sign up for a direct debit on a bill and you don't pay attention to whom you're paying your water bill. Um, those kinds of things we recognize uh, are, are sometimes easy to forget. Um, and so all of the intent behind this was really just to say this unique situation exists that has for decades and decades. Uh, and if, if you're interested, we're happy to talk more about it. But to your point, we will uh, we will get that information out in the next week or so. Okay, um, just a bit of information to share relative to um, the upcoming November 5th election. Um, we get a lot of questions at Village Hall relative to voting information. Um, I would encourage anyone who's interested in making sure they understand exactly what their ballots are going to look like or exactly where their polling place is, um, go to www.cookcountyclerkil.gov. Um, there's actually a, a tool that generates your specific ballot for your address. Um, and you will be able to see that um, and understand uh, before you get to vote uh, exactly what uh, you're going to be asked to vote for. Um, a few dates to remember. Uh, the last day to register online to vote is this coming Sunday, October 20th. The first day of early voting is October 21st, Monday, October 21st. Our closest early voting location to the village of Blanco is the Northbrook Village Hall which is 1225 Cedar Lane in Northbrook. That information is available on the county clerk's website. The last day for mail ballot requests is Halloween, October 31st. The last day for early voting is Monday, November 4th, and then election day is Tuesday, November 5th. Um, we've gotten questions about uh, the village's referendum question and where that will show up on a ballot, the village's referendum will be the second to the last question. There are two referenda in Blanco uh, this, uh, on this ballot, uh, one for the village of Blanco relative to the home rule uh, question. The second is a referendum uh, that the Park District is putting forward relative to uh, bond issuance. Neither of those uh, referenda impact the other. Uh, we have gotten that question, if I vote in favor or against the village's referendum, does that impact the park district's referendum? It does not. Those votes are individual and independent from one another. So just something to be mindful of. And I would just point to uh, the fact that we've had our last public forum on the home rule referendum question that was held last Tuesday at the Glencoe Public Library. Again, our fourth um, of those really well attended, really great questions. Appreciate the community participating. 
coming out and uh, asking questions and getting more information. Uh, there's tons of information still on the village's website relative to the home referendum. I just encourage folks to uh, read up on that if they have further questions. Um, it is, again, time for President Rowan's favorite program to commence, and that is our annual leaf collection program. Uh, that kicks off this coming Monday, October 21st. I've started to see piles of leaves showing up on the curb line um, in anticipation of those uh, leaf backs uh, coming and uh, taking those leaves away. Uh, there's a great deal of information on the program, including our collection map, and other details um, on the village's website. We do update that on a weekly basis to help under, help residents understand when we will be back through neighborhoods uh, and when uh, they can expect those leaf backs to be coming through. Um, just an important reminder that the public works director would be upset with me if I didn't remind everyone, don't rake those leaves into the street, <coughs> keep them on the parkway. <coughs> if you rake them into the street, you clog the storm, storm sewer inlets. You don't want to do that. That floods the streets. That's not helpful. Um, if you see leaves in those inlets, we ask you to adopt that um, particular sewer inlet and remove those leaves. We do get through all of our neighborhoods fairly frequently with our street sweeping equipment, but if you can help us out, um, that is always appreciated, although it does look like we're going to have a couple of weeks of, of uh, lovely fall weather without any rain predicted. So uh, our, our crews will be out there um, supplemented by uh, a contractor who is uh, who's working hard on that program. Uh, we've included in the board's packet tonight our third quarter um, departmental reports. We have hard copies available for the board. Um, I hope you had a chance to flip through it. Um, as we have <coughs> mentioned, uh, each of the last uh, quarters that we have provided this. This is a new initiative this year to articulate a bit of the work, uh, a taste, if you will, of the work that our village teams are accomplishing across the entirety of the organization, internal focus, external focus, and both. Um, and again, I think a, a really nice uh, uh, summary of some of the important things that are going on. Um, and again, this, this covers the third quarter, which is July 1st to September 30th of this year. Um, looking forward, the calendar year 2025 budget, uh, on Tuesday, November 19th, the staff will be presenting the draft budget to the village board at a finance committee meeting for the coming 2025 fiscal year that begins January 1st of 2025. We're anticipating posting those budget documents on the village's website for the community to review no later than November 15th, that's the Friday before. Uh, the meeting on November 19th will be at the Village Hall. So normally uh, we're, we're in the conference room, the Morris conference room on the first floor uh, for that presentation. That is where we will be on November 19th. Uh, so if anyone in the community is planning to participate, please show up there. We will be recording that meeting and posting it uh, after the meeting's over. So feedback that's received from the board that evening will be integrated into the budget document for the December 19th, 2024 village board meeting, where the board will be asked to consider its approval. Um, uh, Deputy Manager CFO Nikki Larson's already announced that the property tax levy public hearing will be November 21st, but it's, it bears repeating. Um, we, are, we have presented and discussed that with the Finance Committee over the past few months. The levy's proposed to increase 3.4% in line with PTEL restrictions. Uh, and again, that public hearing is scheduled for that evening, uh, November 21st, where we will be back here at the Taker Center. Uh, last but not least, Halloween is coming up Thursday, October 31st. I have been um, drafted into family costume wearing, um, and I'll leave to your imagination, uh, but all I know is that in the 80s, I was desperate to have what I am dressing as, um, and uh, my daughters really, really love something called Care Bears, and apparently I'm going to be one. Uh, so look for that on Halloween, if nothing else. Uh, Trick-or-treating hours will take place between 4 and 8 p.m. 
the village's website will have tons of Halloween safety tips. The annual Chamber of Commerce uh, Halloween Hello, which takes place in our downtown, will be from 10 to 5 that day. Uh, don't forget, stop by Village Hall. Um, it is not the scariest place on Halloween, but um, it will, we do a pretty good job of, of decorating. That's Village Hall Oween. Um, and uh, we hope that every kid in town stops by. Um, one last reminder, don't throw the jack-o'-lantern away into your garbage after Halloween. Glencoe Community Garden is again partnering with us for their sixth annual pumpkin smash. Uh, that's taking place Saturday, November 2nd, 10 to noon. Uh, we'll have plenty of information available on e-news and our social media <coughs> platforms. So I have, unless if anyone has any questions. Thanks for that report. Um, I, let me just add by way of background uh, about the lead collection program for what was actually known back in 1992, 1993, that was something I worked on when I was a trustee many years, but speak into my fellow trustees that this was a good idea. The village manager thought this was hysterical, and the first machine was referred to stenciled on its side as the Rowan Master. This thing went through town collecting group. So it's you know one of my favorite programs. I think it's good to have, and I think it's good for uh, residents who don't have to spend their entire fall bagging groups. Okay, uh, village president's report only one item, and that's consideration of proclamation declaring November 2024 as Native American Heritage Month. Uh, the proclamation was published online to the residents, was circulated to board members. Uh, I'm confident that adopting this is consistent with the policy um, that Sammy has presented to us uh, earlier. Unless there are any comments, is there a motion to issue the proclamation? Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Carries. Um, so November is the American Heritage Month. That includes reports of officers. So the next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. The consent agenda includes items that have been published online for the community and reviewed by the board members individually or together as part of our committee to hold discussions. We don't think they warrant any further public discussion, but now's a chance if somebody thinks they do. And if there is, a, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? It's been moved and seconded. I mean, we can roll call on this. Trustee Hallwax. Yes. Trustee Listener. Yes. Trustee Mealopoulos. Yes. Trustee Underdog. Yes. Trustee Rubin. Yes. Yes. Carry consent agenda. The next item on the agenda is regular business. The first item of that is consideration of ordinance granting a special use permit to allow an interior design business on the ground floor. Zoning District at 340 Park Avenue. I'll ask our Development Services Director Taylor to actually present and very briefly provide everybody why we're doing this. Absolutely. Uh, so, this is uh, a post uh, interior design business again at 342 Park Avenue. Uh, this requires a special use permit because of the recent update to the zoning code that was uh, adopted by the Village Board earlier this year. That requires all non restaurant, all non retail uses in B1 zoning district, for B1 zoning district. So, um, on the ground floor um, to get an SUV. I have there's not mentioned ground floor, but it's only for the ground floor. Uh, this proposed use is uh, again 342 Park Avenue between Village Court and Vernon. Um, the proposed use is an interior design business. Um, the applicant has stated that this is uh, largely uh, it is an interior design business. Uh, it's a component that needs to start is proposed to be by appointment. Um, the business already has a consulting space in Chicago. Um, again, uh, because this is non-retail, um, an SUP is required, although the applicant has said that there is a consultant to this business. Uh, 
the special use permit process is a two-step process. Step one is a public hearing with the Zoning Commission. Uh, this happened earlier this month on the 7th of October. Uh, the Zoning Commission holds a public hearing and makes a recommendation. And then we're on step two, which is the final step where the village board makes a final decision on the application. Um, a couple things that the Zoning Commission um, considered when uh, they had the public hearing. Um, this space really is exceptionally small. It's about 250 to 300 square feet, um, with about 200 square feet of storage in the basement. Um, so there were some questions about whether this could realistically uh, be a restaurant. Um, for comparison, um, a lot of our restaurants are 2,500 to 5,000 or more square feet. Um, I think the honey butter and milk all the square feet might be switched there, but the point still stands that um, this is much, much smaller than our, our larger restaurants. Um, staff was looking for the smallest restaurant space that you could think of in downtown Glen Carly, and that was True Juice, which is about 660 square feet. So this space is, is less than half the size of True Juice. Um, the Zoning Commission uh, agreed it's very unlikely that this would become um, a restaurant. Um, retail, um, the Zoning Commission also determined that this was, um, besides, unlikely to have much of a, a different impact on downtown than a, a similarly sized retail space would, um, would have. Um, there are criteria for uh, special use permits. They're, they're outlined in the agenda packet. Um, these include some things like uh, impacts on surrounding properties, public utilities, and traffic. Very unlikely this would have uh, much of an impact on surrounding property or traffic. Um, another thing to consider is whether a different location without an SUP requirement uh, is preferable. That would be Albert Woods or Albert Moore. Um, the applicant has stated that this does have a retail component and if you want to move um, on the ground floor to get this small space. <coughs> and the Zoning Commission unanimously recommended approval of this. And again, they determined it was too small to be a, a restaurant, too small to have a single retail. Uh, there's been no opposition to this uh, in public comments. Um, we did have several written letters of support, um, which are included in the back. And uh, the applicant is here this evening to have questions for her. Ms. Hayden, is that you? Yes, that's me. Okay. Uh, I don't think your request is in trouble, but if you'd like to say anything to us. Um, I just, you know, I think um, we're excited to be here and we're new members of the community. So we have a house not far from downtown Glencoe. You know, you know two kids in school here. And yeah, I think, you know, I have a successful business out of Chicago and I, I hope that it'll bring a lot of, you know, beautification to town. And also I'm interested to know that we have, I've been learning a lot at these two public meetings I've been a part of, and very interested to know there's a preservation commission. Um, we specifically do a lot of work restoring historic properties and we bought a home of our own that is um, a house we're gonna restore. So yeah, hopefully it'll, it'll really be a nice part of the community and we're hopeful that it will um, be approved. And then further, I just provided the feedback to Taylor that would be helpful to remind all landlords of this because when we signed the lease for the space, we were not told about a special use permit. And so, you know, there's, I was lucky that I was in the position to not need to open right away, but should I have been someone who, you know, rented this space and then really needed that business for the next six weeks, it would have been a very difficult situation. I appreciate that suggestion. We try to do that landlord should be, of course, the landlords care too, because they don't, you know, they can't charge for the Just like to, we did reach out to oh, the we did. many times. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess the broker, or whoever, nobody, nobody really. And and I do think I'm sure it'll start to become, you know, more of a thing because I have friends that have studios in when I call Hubbard Works, and everybody knows there's a special use permit. So, which is interesting to be the, the first. Mm -hmm. Oh, congratulations, Mr. Uh, uh, clarification: If I were to buy a couch. Oh, would the sales tax go to your Chicago business or to Glenco? That's a good question. Um, 
I don't know, honestly. I would assume it would go to wherever my business is registered. It should go to your <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can talk to my bookkeeper. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's registered as an online sale. It'll go for a destination. And then it depends on how you have two different location IDs. There should be a gun code or action ID because that helps go off. Okay. Anybody have any concerns? Yes. Front line along the building. So, if you go in front, you find the 
for this point, I'm not going to try to try to put in front of my mind. That is your accessory structure setback. That would say on every single lot, you cannot have a accessory structure or pool or sport cord or anything like it in front of the house. Um, uh, it does not change the fact that accessory structures must meet front and side setback requirements. So the front setback requirement for the house still has to meet that, no matter where the house is. It can't be inside side setbacks. Um, current uh, ordinance, the current code has uh, is very unclear about how this is supposed to be applied to corner lots. This clarifies that. It says that it does not apply to corner setbacks. This is just for front setbacks. And then it also empowers staff to make reasonable applications on three lots because it was also quite unclear about how to apply on three lots. And that means that um, staff basically can make a uh, reasonable interpretation of what is functional in the front yard and apply this setback to the front yard of that lot. A three lot is a lot that has frontage on two non intersecting streets. So a street in front of this has to be back there. So this went to the Zoning Commission and had a public hearing. Um, the, uh, the Zoning Commission was directed by the Village Board um, from that first meeting to pay special attention to um, how accessory structures should be regulated either next to houses as opposed to fully behind houses. Because this amendment, as proposed, would allow uh, accessory structures with the same setback from the front as the house itself. Um, accessory structures next to houses are not currently prohibited. There are many, many examples throughout the a village of uh, detached garages, um, outdoor kitchens, swimming pools, tennis courts that are next to houses, not behind. This would not change that. For the same time, on most, most lots, it would likely allow those accessory structures to be a bit closer to the front lot line than currently. Um, so the zoning code, the zoning commission thought about this in great detail, and they agreed that the current accessory structure regulations do not work. They're confusing. They don't meet the intent. They don't. Uh, they cause a lot of unnecessary delays. Um, but they wanted additional distance from the front lot line uh, compared to what staff originally proposed, which is the same front setback for the house and the accessory structure. So the zoning commission recommended an additional ten feet of front setback requirement. From what from the uh, that point along the front of the house. So this is the uh, the uh, proposed amendment. It's in your uh, packet right now. Um, I highlighted what was added by the zoning commission. This is the same amendment that was in your packet for the previous meeting. The highlighted part is what was added by the zoning commission for their recommendation. So it says that it shall not be near to the front lot line, the furthest point from the front lot line along the building front. The building front is also defined in the zoning code. Um, of the principal structure on the lot plus 10 feet. This just means it has to be set at 10 feet from the front of the house. Um, and then the part of the bottom talks about three lots, basically giving staff the ability to make a decision. Um, so, in summary, on, on most but not all lots, um, this amendment is going to provide, as proposed, some more flexibility for where you can locate these accessory structures, pools, etc., while maintaining the intent of the code. Will not allow them inside setbacks and will not allow them in front of houses. Uh, but it should help to reduce the unnecessary number of unnecessary variations or people unnecessarily pushing pools or uh, detached lots closer to the zones of bluffs in the backyard uh, when it, these things are already located completely mostly, most of the time behind the house. Um, so the next step would be to uh, move to adopt and guide the ordinance with any changes that need to be determined to be appropriate. That uh, is that what work. Um, it's a good question. Uh, you know, we sorry about that. But so the only difference now is, is the 10 feet. Is there any reason to think that the 10 feet is going to create additional problems with all of a sudden accessory structures? Like that we would think we're okay or not be okay with the fire breach? There are a, I would say that the, the overwhelming majority of lots, this is still going to provide more flexibility. There are going to be a small number of lots where this could potentially actually increase the restriction level. And those would be lots that are very, uh, that very small, uh, shallow, shallow yeah. lots, or lots where the house is set back very far on the bottom. Because instead of doing the 50%, it's now based on the house location. So there will be a small number of lots. So there, there are examples for sure, and we've looked at them. Uh, Accessory structures that will be pushed back 10 feet or more from where they are now. Um, that is the exception to the rule. So, the answer to that is in some, in some instances, yes. Well, 
you know, if it turns out, I mean, I, I sort of get the point. I mean, our point is we don't, we have an idea of what's supposed to be in the front yard. And if we allow an accessory structure to just expand this, all of a sudden we have what appears to be an edifice that we don't have to do. If this is fixed, which is only because you may pull this time for itself. But this all makes sense to me. We've already thought about it. Are there any other questions about this? And if not, is there a motion to approve? Just one question. Um, you talked about discretion regarding the through loss. Does that also apply, like in the, in the case of a house that is very set back, if, if there were something which was to be within that 10 feet, once this passes that, that's right. The, the staff would not have discretion, okay. but the applicant could request a 10% overall setback reduction from the zoning board without going through the variation process. But no, this is as written now, staff does not have any discretion to reduce that. You reduce it on any lot, but it just gives staff the discretion if there are, if it's a crew lot with two front yards, and we have the discretion to choose which front yards to apply. So that's no discretion. It's yeah. not, we need to look at code sometimes. The through lot, the most logical thing is, well, where's the front door? Um, but that's not actually how a lot of codes are written. It depends on through lots, which are, which are rare, but do exist. So this is trying to address that, that at some point you have to call what is the need for help. Um, I think the zoning commission did seems smart. We can't be sure it's perfect. Zoning ordinances are never perfect. There's you can always allow something as you would like to permit something or don't allow something that happens. That happens, but it's pretty sensible. So I think a good idea. Is there a motion to approve the ordinance as amended by the Zoning Commission? So moved. Then move second. Do us have a rule call? Trustee Hallwax? Yes. Trustee Listener? Yes. Trustee Neilopoulos? Yes. Trustee Otterdown? Yes. Trustee Rubin? Yes. Trustee Scott. Yes. Um, motion carries. Uh, I move the Next item on the agenda is consideration of the resolution authorizing the village manager to section the contract for the construction of the Long Term Illinois for the Public Safety Department living quarters and the renovation project in the amount not to exceed $1,600,000. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to begin by providing a brief overview of the project's background and why this renovation is important. Uh, calendar year 2024 and 2025 budget uh, include funding for the complete renovation of the public safety department's dormitory and upper room, um, as well as the village hall's council chambers. These facilities have not undergone substantial improvements uh, in several decades and are now inadequate for the needs of our current and future staff. Uh, the dormitories, locker rooms, and shower facilities date back to 1956 and have significant deficiencies in need of addressing to ensure safety, privacy, and functionality for the village's public safety officers. Similarly, the council chambers last updated in 1992 require facility and technology upgrades to support public needs, staff trainings, and service our emergency operations center, or EOC, in a time of crisis. In 2022, we issued a request for proposals for design services, and after a thorough review, Kluber Architects and Engineers Incorporated and ABI Systems were selected to design and manage the renovations from an architectural and design and audiovisual focus, respectively. This collaborative effort resulted in a project plan that balances our need for updated functionality and modernization while also keeping cost efficiency in mind. The proposed project timeline spans approximately eight months, uh, starting with the public safety dormitory and locker room renovations this November. The existing conditions uh, shown here of the dormitories and locker rooms for the public safety department are in need of improvements. Currently, there are no walls or separation in there is a laser here, but uh, on the left side of there, um, that's where they, that's where the uh, male public safety officers currently sleep. There's no separation there for privacy. Um, there are no walls and 
sleeping space in the locker rooms, showers, sinks, and the locker room systems require replacement, retiling, and updates to the plumbing system. The lockers are also in need of uh, replacement due to the age and condition of the existing lockers and the unique needs of the public safety department. As we get into the renovations, this is a little more complicated than the last one. Uh, renovations will include the institution of separate individual bunk rooms, allowing for additional privacy, a desk, and a distinct living space for public safety officers when staying at Village Hall overnight. Additionally, the bathroom and showers will be improved to include a private changing area. Uh, bathrooms will be installed adjacent to the bunk rooms in addition to the upgraded showers. A replacement locker system, which was bid with an alternate locker system option for competitive pricing, will include specialized compartments for ballistic vests and other public safety equipment. The improvements to the locker room will encapsulate substantial improvements to the capability of supporting overnight and meeting the needs for a 24 7 population. The space right next to the right here next to the staircase is the hose tower. Um, that goes two floors. Um, it was used to dry extended lengths of the hose before materials improved to a point where the space is no longer needed for its original use. As a tall room that is, you know, multiple floors and extends to the public safety bay, a partition floor will be installed uh, in the middle. Um, and a decontamination shower and full bathroom will be added to the public safety bay, which will be a priority for construction, uh, kind of happening in one of the first in the beginning phases, which we'll talk about in a second, to ensure the public safety officers uh, have a shower on site during construction. Uh, in that same space, uh, that's actually going to be used for locker space. Um, and then directly above that um, will be the creation of a mother's room for use by the staff. Work on the council chambers will begin once the dormitory renovations are complete in April of 2025. And again, we'll talk about uh, dates and phasing in a little bit. Uh, with the proposed renovations addressing programmatic needs of the chamber, uh, the space will become more versatile and available for a wider array of public assemblage and public and staff needs. Chambers will also be designed for use as the village's EOC in the event of a significant emergency. Here's some key product dates. Uh, bids were opened on October 9th and staff received a recommendation from Kluver on Friday, October 11th. Phase, for me. Uh, phase one will consist of the renovations to the public safety side, which will include temporary conversion of the council chambers into a living space for public safety officers during construction. From now until mid-November, staff will be working on the installation of drywall and lighting in the chambers uh, for the use of the space. The architect and the staff team are anticipating phase one completion in spring of 2025. At that time, phase two will begin. As the public safety officers move from the council chambers uh, but into their newly renovated public safety living quarters, work can commence on the upgrades to the council chambers. Substantial completion of phase two and wrapping up of the entire project is tentatively anticipated for June uh, 2025. Please note that this contract does not include the costs associated with new furniture uh, for both the council chambers and the public safety side of the house. Um, this will be included in the draft budget request uh, for 2025. Initially, staff estimated the total project cost to be in the neighborhood of $1.9 million, including the audiovisual components, plumbing, post tower conversion, uh, and several deferred maintenance issues, including upgrades to the HVAC um, and electrical systems. Uh, when we received the bids and the recommendation, our, our low bid was $1,620,000. Um, coupled with the furniture furniture purchase point, uh, staff estimates that things are kind of where we were hoping they would be, which is good news. Um, so tonight, staff is requesting board approval of a motion authorizing contract with Construction Incorporated uh, for the Council Chambers Public Safety Renovations Project. Um, that um, staff are available to answer any questions. Thanks for that clear report. We have talked about this idea before. Um, let me clear the board. The word is not feathering this nest here. Uh, our council chambers have been for a long, long time. I periodically get complaints about the quality of our streaming. Fixing that is important to fix the uh, orders for our public safety program. So we knew what we were going 
definitely got this back, but it sounds like look at this track on the other architects. So seems like a good idea to me. Let's get the show on the road so we can get back home sometime here. Uh, are there any questions or comments? Uh, is there a motion to And one quick question. How many bits did we get? We received 10. We, we put it out publicly and then they yes. know it's every 10. Yes, they had it on our website and then the architect also had it in their plan room, which goes out to their. Great. Thanks. And we, sure. we're, we take it a little bit. Yes. Is there a motion to approve? No. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. So a roll call, please. Trustee Hollowax? Yes. Trustee Listener? Yes. Trustee Milopoulos? Yes. Trustee Otterdown? Yes. Trustee Rubin? Yes. Trustee Scott? Yes. The motion carries. Uh, so, uh, next this contract, we get the show on the road. Next item on the agenda is consideration of the confirming resolution ratifying a professional services agreement for instant information technology and services with. Law Court, Law Technology, Woodbridge, Illinois, in an amount not to exceed $4,000. And I'll ask our Deputy Village Manager and Finance Director Nikki Larson to present. Oh, and we should include also the next item, which is consideration of the resolution, resolution approving a professional services agreement for information and technology services with OEM Taken Buffer, Woods, Illinois.
of some network switches in phase one in February, as well as some significant cybersecurity upgrades. Additional issues have been identified through continued work on our system, uh, including the most recent scans performed by Portfall Technologies. Uh, these, these problems required immediate action, which brought the need to expedite our phase two network cut of work. Pursuant to the authority granted in April, OEM King has been engaged to complete this work, which includes reconfiguring and monitoring the SCADA systems at our sanitary sewer lift stations, ensuring operational stability and security. Upgrading the core network switches to replace obsolete equipment that is vital for our internal communications. Installing the network gateway to improve the security of data flow between the village systems and our external entities, such as our emergency dispatch center. Supporting the cloud migration, migration for the public safety departments, CAD and RMS systems, which is utilized for their emergency calls and their reporting system. Uh, this was a crucial update that was initiated by Glenview Dispatch to keep our emergency response systems running without interruption and also providing a redundant option. And lastly, upgrading the network connection to the water plant, providing a redundant connection to this critical facility. As part of this work, OEMP will provide 24 7 support throughout the various remaining steps of this transition, addressing any unforeseen issues that may arise during this complex process. And this will, manage, will also manage the safe disposal of any outdated equipment to ensure that uh, our systems remain secure. This work began in mid-September and is progressing on schedule with completion expected in early November. Ratifying this contract will allow us to finish this crucial phase and further ensure the stability of our system. Any questions on the second slide? We use one cloud or one cloud? For village staff purposes, we use just one cloud, which is my Go with you know you want to no, I mean, we're going to cloud assuming, right? Like it gives us some scale to add and add reduced capacity when we need it, don't need it, right? And, and you, you can add another one fairly easily because the competition and the prices are getting pretty fierce between two of them, or between three of them, or how many of them. right? The, the reason the reason why we're going to probably stay with Microsoft is because Microsoft is certified by back by background. We're getting the, uh, the good pricing because of the contract with the state of Illinois. So we're getting the, the best prices for the specific subscription per user. And, and we get the uh, redundancy in our cloud environment that is not provided on the, on the commercial level uh, for any, any commercial entities. So it's a the state commission? Yeah. Yes, it's a state. It's a state contract. Yes. So no. There's a different cloud environments that provide us from the third party vendors. Yes, like family technologies they use in AWS. But for our staff purposes, we use in just the Azure environment because the most amount of protection. Same. Any other questions? Okay. Um, I think probably two separate votes on these. You can, oh, can, you can do a single motion to approve that president. Okay. Um, and let me just say information technology isn't in an area that provides potentially a lot of benefits for us to do our job better. And but the security issues create, you know, opportunities for disaster. Uh, and we have a lot of sensitive stuff. Yes. Trustee Scott. Yes. Trustee Scott. Yes. Those two motions are carried. Okay. Last item. 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 Okay
CSOs are receiving hand me down vehicles uh, from police control. Uh, those vehicles have been repurposed. Uh, mind you, they're, uh, they're repurposed from police control because they have no longer, uh, they no longer have a lifetime. We feel it's no longer cost efficient to maintain them as police pursuit vehicles when they hand them down to uh, CSOs. This marks uh, the first in, in anyone's memory for recent purchasing or attempting to purchase new vehicles. Uh, for the CSOs. Now, um, I mentioned the LPR systems because the LPR system uh, it has very specific needs when it comes to size, height, uh, and type of people they can be mounted on to be used efficiently and effectively. Uh, we initially were looking at some other vehicles, and ultimately we, we reviewed upwards of 10 different types of vehicles for the specific purpose of identifying uh, what will be functional for the system and also uh, to be able to find, uh, to grow our EV fleet to further. Uh, Enhance our commitment uh, to modification of fleet to more electric vehicles. Uh, what we found was the best vehicle suited for the purpose uh, was a 2024 Chevy uh, Police Pursuit Vehicle EV Blazer. Um, so the Chevy Blazer, we have an EV version of it. We feel it meets our need. We feel it's the right vehicle. Uh, after again, as I mentioned, we compared a number of vehicles. Uh, we then looked to see by uh, directly checking with General Motors see who offers those specific vehicles on the market. Typically, the village purchases uh, our vehicles from dealers that have been awarded the Suburban Purchasing Cooperative contract. That allows us for the competitive bidding process to have already taken place, and we get the best price. Um, in this particular uh, instance, we, we checked with, G, uh, with General Motors uh, specifically. They informed us that there were only two dealerships in the state that sold vehicles, that sold the EV vehicles. Curie Motors uh, and Miles and Chevrolet. Um, Curie Motors, we have uh, we regularly purchase vehicles from them. Um, GE or General Motors informed us that uh, once we spoke with uh, Curie Motors to get price, which is the price that we can work back at, uh, General Motors verified that that price is the same price as with the other uh, with Miles Chevrolet, and that is in essence the lowest price. Those vehicles have already been ordered. Uh, I mean, they have already ordered firearms contract. So those will be readily available. Um, this prevents an issue where we've done in the past where we we're ready to make purchases of vehicles, vehicles are ordered, and then suddenly we receive a, a whole slew of vehicles all at once, putting us on the book for not only, not only making a large scale purchase, 
uh, but also second, uh, when later on it becomes time for opening up vehicles out of our fleet, we're, uh, we're tied to, we're potentially tied to uh, an extensively large purchase at that time. Um, we have already funded, uh, we already have as part of our CIP and replacement vehicle, um, one of the two CSO vehicles that was already ready to go. Uh, what we were doing is we were utilizing monies unspent from the second administrative vehicle to purchase the second. Now, lastly, it comes to the license plate reader system itself. Um, the license plate reader itself is, is outlined in the memo. Uh, it's going to be purchased from, it's a Genetech system. Uh, it's going to be purchased as part of the come with a five year warranty. Uh, second uh, existing license plate reader system uh, also include that price quote is to move that existing system to the second vehicle. Therefore, uh, we'll double the amount of the potential, or we'll double the amount of LPRs we get more of the vehicles. Any questions on the here? We have the license plate readers as we drive into town. Now we're going to have license plate readers on vehicles. So, I, it, allow me. So, license plate readers is a generic term. Uh, it can't be used as a generic term, not on the say general or general. Uh, license plate readers that when we come into town, those are fixed positions. Those uh, have a specific purpose of reading license plates, as it says. Um, and that alerts us to, you know, that alerts us to wanted vehicles, missing vehicles. Um, People like say amber alerts, uh, silver alerts, those sort of things. Um, that is patched in the release as opposed to um, these vehicles, the LPRs, uh, these LPRs are specifically designed for parking enforcement. The CSOs do not have access to that data as far as the missing vehicles, especially the modern vehicles, high cars. Um, these are specifically, it is a license plate and LPR system, uh, but that's it's a separate uh, system in its entirety. What's the short version of how it works for parking enforcement? <coughs> What's the short version of how it works for parking enforcement? Uh, REITs, it, it, and an important thank you for reminding me, um, this will also help us support our virtual sticker program. And, or, uh, and you're involved when somebody doesn't have a sticker and they're going to get a nasty guy. They're going to be real popular. Correct. <laughs> yeah, so as you're driving through, it'll read the license plate. It'll say, say it'll say, the, and it also like mentioned previously, it'll compare the position of the vehicle, uh, exactly where it was the last time it and, also a timestamp, and it'll say it's been parked here for three hours, four hours, it's been too long, therefore it's a violation. Uh, it alerts the screen, then the operator then gets out and issues a citation. Uh, it also catalogs a picture of before and after for evidence purpose uh, if we can test the citation. Uh, also in addition to that, we will uh, have continually updating database of who has and who has not, or who has or has not purchased the vehicle stickers. Therefore, if, if it comes across somebody who has not purchased the vehicle sticker, they'll alert and say site directly site as well. It's expected to see increased revenue from uh, there short answer <coughs> yes, but I'm always afraid to bring in revenue when it comes to law enforcement. I would just say at that <coughs> point that's not the intent. I think the intent is compliance always. And I think that's an important distinction to make. Um, I, I would also point to this virtual sticker program is something we'll talk more about in the budget process uh, over the next few months. But this has been an ongoing discussion among the finance committee and the rest of the going forward about trying to streamline a pretty um, administrative heavy program <clears throat> that generally uh, the community uh, has a, a mixed record on compliance with. And so I think the goal is to try to continue the program. This is a component to that, but I would say that the primary purpose of it in this particular instance is focused on parking enforcement, both in our commuter parking lots and in the downtown business district. Do we have enough chargers for the new cars? Yes, sir. We'll, we'll do what we call hot racking them. So what we'll do is we press and we have uh, enough chargers. So uh, but we will. As, as vehicles are charged during the day, we anticipate these vehicles to be charged overnight. So we'll just have to look around. Them. As if we add these two vehicles, we should not have a problem. I would just add, um, I think I'm correct in with the, um, with the, oh gosh, I'm tired. The um, license plate readers for parking enforcement, to me, that feels really responsive to a lot of the complaints we've heard from business owners, which Seems like we spend a lot of our time talking to folks, assuring them there's enough parking and you can park here and you can park there. And you know, 
to the extent that there's this ongoing concern that people are parked for hours and hours and hours of time and the police aren't doing anything you know it does provide you know it's as, as um, chief blocker mentioned we've been doing this uh, with this current system since 2000 um, it was integrated while we were in the midst of the pandemic but it had been planning uh, a couple of years prior to that it has streamlined the process uh, it's made it easier uh, it's made it more uh, quantifiable and justifiable if you will so when the complaints come through we're able to compare well when we drove past and we drove past two hours and 45 minutes later we're still there um, and so that that very clear data is also helpful i think in the department's work so any other questions um thank you for the very clear presentation i do want to reiterate uh, we are not Ferguson, Missouri. We're not trying to find a way to raise revenue through this. It's what the uh, manager said. My clients, uh, people are coming in and out of parking spaces so that people are able to be uptown Glencoe when they want to be in for our residents and for our businesses. With that, uh, is there a motion to approve the resolution waiting competitive bidding? For the two blazers and the license filter. Second. Second. Trustee Hallwax? Yes. Trustee Lister? Yes. Trustee Neilopoulos? Yes. Trustee Underdog? Yes. Trustee Rubin? Yes. Trustee Scott? Yes. Motion um, carries. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, is there any other business? If not, uh, we don't get to uh, work with that. Your motion for uh, us to move the closed session to uh, 2C2 collective bargaining and 2C1 employment matters uh, pursuant to the open consent. Move the closed session. Second. Uh, roll call. Trustee Hallwax. Yes. Trustee Lister. Yes. Trustee Neilopoulos. Yes. Trustee Underdog. Yes. Trustee Rubin. Yes. Trustee Scott. Yes. Areas. We're moving to the down the hall. Mm -hmm. yeah. 